everyone, and welcome to the show. This is episode number 111 of Pop Culturally Deprived, and today we're going to be talking about Edge of Tomorrow on your Who Said You Could Talk to Me podcast. I'm Andy Kay. And I'm Matthew Vose. We are here at the very edge of tomorrow. Yes, yes, we are. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> um, a fairly recent film we don't often do. Well, we occasionally do films that, that are as recent as this. Um, mm-hmm. So how come you haven't seen this one? Time, mostly. I've wanted to see this one since I saw the trailers, but I just never got around to it, I guess. Okay. Who has time to watch movies, you know? Ugh. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Because there's not much chat to do until we really get into it, is there? Uh, there's not. Not on this one this week. I no, think. okay. I think we're good. Just let's go. Edge of Tomorrow is a 2014 science fiction action film directed by Doug Lyman and starring Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt. It is based on a Japanese novel called All You Need Is Kill by Hiroshi Sakurazaka. It was retitled to the movie's tagline Live, Die, Repeat when it was released on streaming and home media. There were several screenwriters. One of the final people involved in writing it, um, worked with them during production, was the frequent Tom Cruise collaborator Christopher McQuarrie. Doug Lyman had wanted the title to be Live, Die, Repeat, but Warner insisted on Edge of Tomorrow as they wanted it to be considered more of a serious science fiction film. But the director himself had actually made a more comedic, light-hearted story. The film was lauded by critics for its humour, performances, effects, and the fresh take on the time loop. But despite this, it was considered a disappointment to the box office, taking only $100 million in the US, much less than its $170 million budget, and about the same as the marketing budget for the film. This is given as a reason they branded it differently when it was released on home media, although it did make over $270 million at the overseas box office. A sequel is in production, and is currently titled Live, Die, Repeat, and Repeat. Interesting. I did not know that last bit. Yeah, I don't think that title is going to stick. Okay, I hope not, because it's no. a really terrible title. I mean, if it was Live, Die, Rinse and Repeat, it would be excellent. <laughs> that would be a good title. <laughs> is it still going to be like Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt? Yeah. So I think same director, I would imagine still Christopher McQuarrie. He and Tom Cruise are doing basically everything together these days. Um, there have been comments about it being a very different sequel than you would normally see. What I think they're actually going to do is basically remake this film. But hmm. now the aliens know what's happening. So basically they introduce a, a... Okay, let's stop. We are, as ever, going to be going into spoilers, and I'm going into spoilers right now. Okay. <laughs> Just in case anyone's, you know... Um, uh, it, what if they introduced an, another level of, you know, we've got the Alphas, we've got the Omega. What if we've got the Zeros or something, you know? Okay. okay. Um, I, 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 from the comments they've made, I think that's the sort of approach they might take to it. Which would be really interesting, like remaking the original film, but with a new plot. <laughs> that's quite cool. I, that is. I'm, I'm very intrigued. Hmm. The uh, the book, because it was released as um, a, a light novel aimed at sort of uh, teen boys, effectively, um, in Japan. It's a- it is actually called "All You Need Is Kill" in English, effectively using the sort of very uh, westernized version of the speech. Mm-hmm. I don't know a better way to describe it. Like, they they want it to sound kind of cool and interesting. So to us, it's like, okay, that's a really weird title. Right. But I, I can imagine it really working when it's, oh, it sounds a little bit exotic and different. Mm-hmm. Mm. I didn't realize it was a book until I looked at the outline. Okay. I've been reading it. I've not gotten as far through it as I wanted to. Okay. Because I've, I've got video games. Um, oh, of course. And, and of course. woodworking. Great. Okay. <laughs> We'll come to the differences in a bit, I think. Okay. Because um, there are, you know, numerous. If, if anyone hasn't seen this, which this is a film worth seeing, guys. Go go and watch it. Um, and then pause and come back. Mandy, what's this film about? Well, IMDb says, A soldier fighting aliens gets to relive the same day over and over again, the day restarting every time he dies. That's good. That's on point. 
The only thing that I take issue with is calling Cage a soldier. Because even he recognizes at the beginning of the film that he is not a soldier. I mean, by the end of it, he's absolutely a soldier. But in the beginning, he's not. So He's in the military. He is in the military. Yes. Yeah. Although he's an officer. But yeah. Anyway. I, I think that's closer than generally they get. <laughs> yes. And it actually doesn't that. give away any of the plot itself. It's... It gives away less plot than the trailer does, mm. which is unusual for IMDb because they like to spoil things. Mm. Yeah, because well, and there's not much to spoil in this. In some ways, there's the detail about what is actually going on, but you know, it's not like there are reveals as it goes through. Right, that's true. So, how were you able to watch this film? This actually is one of Joseph's favorite movies. He says it's mm. in his top five, and so wow. he owns it. And it's funny, I was start. I started watching it one day before he came home from work, and I was about 40 minutes in, and he came in, and he's like, oh, you're watching Edge of Tomorrow? And I was like, yeah, and he said, oh, I want to watch it. And so I restarted it and watched the first 40 minutes twice in a row before I finished it. It's 34 minutes until the time loop kicks in, so you basically time looped the first time loop. I did, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I like that. And actually, that's, that's what I was going to say. It, it's... Most films about time loops, you know what you're going to see going into it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of good it gets to it pretty efficiently. Yeah. Compared to other things of this type. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How were you able to watch it? Do you own this one? I don't. Um, I, I first saw it, I rented it on DVD from Love Film, and that still existed. Uh, and was just blown away by how good it was. So, you know, made Catherine watch it as, as soon as I could. Like, this is actually really good. I thought it was going to be terrible. Um, <laughs> not terrible, because obviously if I thought it was going to be terrible, I wouldn't have watched it. Right. Um, but yeah, it was surprisingly good. But this time around, it's not on any streaming services. And, and to the extent Amazon even says, we're just not allowed to show this. Right. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was on broadcast TV. Like, an actual TV channel showed it. Wow. So I, I recorded it on my Skybox. Nice. It, who knew that was still a thing? <laughs> what great timing, honestly. Mm. <laughs> Otherwise, you were going to have to buy the DVD. Yeah. I will admit, I do have a few on the, the basically the DVR, um, that I think like, oh, I think we're going to do that at some point. So I'll record it. I mean, it's Stranger Than Fiction is on there. Oh, God. Um, Inside Out, the the live action Jungle Book stuff like that, that yeah. is probably going to be available on streaming. But just in case, just I might in as case. well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look at you thinking ahead. Yeah, and, and it helps that it's like a two terabyte hard <laughs> drive. So right, right. Yeah, and I freed up all that space by deleting Teen Titans Go recently because it was about eighty percent full, and forty percent of it was that. Oh wow! Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, we, we've talked about Tom Cruise before, although is, is Top Gun the only thing we've done of his? Yes. Okay. But we have talked about Tom Cruise. Um, Doug Lyman, I think, is new to the show, and Emily Blunt we've seen in supporting roles, but what's your experience of those two? Uh, Doug Lyman, I have seen The Bourne Identity and Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Okay. So, clearly, he likes doing the action films. Mm -hmm. And then Emily Blunt... So I first became aware of her with the Devil Wears Prada, but then she was also in Looper, which we have done on the show. And I think even though I haven't actually seen Mary Poppins Returns, like she is Mary Poppins to me now <laughs> from okay. all of the trailers. How interesting. I cannot wait to see that movie. <laughs> um, but yeah, so very different characters than what we get here. Mm. I I didn't realize she was the girl already working there in The Devil Wears Prada. Oh, okay. When I saw that, I was like, wow, is that really her? I had to go and look her up. Totally forgotten her. Yeah. Mm. That's absolutely her. Um, Doug Lyman did a film called Swingers. Yes. Which I loved in my late teens, and I'm not sure I've seen it since. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I'm, I, I'm a little bit worried to watch it. I feel like I might watch it and go, oh, God, this is just bad and problematic. Right. Or it could be really good. And I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to tempt it. <laughs> maybe just let it remain good in your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Don't, don't ruin your teenage self hmm. in, in, in like trying to watch it again. 
Um, trying to compare Edge of Tomorrow, Live, Die, Repeat, All You Need Is Kill to other things. Uh, one of the things that stands out is this is a very video gamey film. Um, mm-hmm. The the chap who wrote the book uh, actually based it on his experience of playing video games. Um, and even some of the aesthetic calls back to sort of sci-fi combat games. Uh, what's your experience of that sort of thing? My initial reaction to your question was none because i think of war video games and i think of things like halo i've never played halo okay. and i said that to joseph and joseph's like um excuse me you play destiny 2 all the time and it's the <laughs> same thing and i was like yeah. huh you're right and he's like it's exactly the same thing he's like because you go into a strike and you get into the restricted zone and then you die and it resets you to the checkpoint and you have to do it again <laughs> like you are absolutely right and you're fighting aliens so yeah destiny 2 okay yeah very much so and and I think the original basis for this, and and in, in some ways things like Groundhog Day, is very much the sort of Mario thing okay. of respawning. You know, you've got a level and you have to attempt it and figure out how to do it. The This film and this story feels very much more like uh, Dark Souls, which is although you need to learn the exact things to do to get through a sequence and deal with you know, this enemy coming at you, this thing happening, this whatever... Mm-hmm. largely the world is just laid open to you and you just go and explore it and you have to try and figure out what you can and can't do at different times. Right. Um, I, 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 This film gives me much more of that kind of vibe with the fact that he can do his ending up going to the beach and then figuring out training and then going to the beach and then actually what if I just skip the beach entirely and then what if I want to go back to Whitehall? How does that work? And mm-hmm. as the film progresses, oh, there are different things I could be doing. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I just don't have vast experience with with these kind of video games. Mm. So. Interesting you saying Halo, because that is the one, the the actual vibe and aesthetic of the beach fights Mm -hmm. is very Halo. You knew that it was Halo, but you haven't experienced it. Yeah, I've only seen like screen grabs and trailers and stuff of Halo. But that's that's what immediately crossed into my mind whenever you said war combat video games. Mm Mm-hmm. Um. I, I don't know why Destiny didn't when I have logged many, many hours of Destiny in the last year. <laughs> yeah, hey, Halo is exactly what I think as well. I'm a huge Halo fan um, and, and very much the armored power suit, the jumping, running, mm-hmm. you know, heads up display, all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. I did get a little bit of Pacific Rim vibes from it too. Mm. Yeah, I Not. Can not like to the extent that they're the same kind of movie, but just sci-fi alien monsters, and you're wearing a suit. Yeah, you know, just just kind of similar. Mm-hmm. Um, but when my experience is limited, I have to yeah. draw comparisons where I can. And and that is very much something that we've seen in many many other films. Yeah, the Matrix sequels, uh, Avatar, stuff like that. Hmm. Hmm. It is it is a trope unto itself by at this point. Okay, Edge of Tomorrow, all you need is kill, live, die, repeat, whatever you want to call it. Did you enjoy this film? You may recall on the show that I have said I have never seen a Tom Cruise movie that I did not love. Okay. That streak continues with Edge okay. of Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I love this movie. It's so good. Right. I actually so, rewatched it last night because we were supposed to record a little while ago, mm-hmm. and so it's been a couple weeks since I saw it, and I was mm-hmm. like, eh, I should rewatch it just to re-familiarize myself with it before we talk about it, and like, it was so good, and I just picked up so many more things the second time through that I didn't get the first time through, and I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's a really well done. Uh, the, the story itself is really well done, and the idea and the way they use the time loop is very, very good. Uh, like we said up top, he has made it actually quite lighthearted in a number of ways. There was a really interesting quote from Tom Cruise where he compared, because he was obviously involved in the production and, and the, the initial writing of it. Um, mm-hmm. He compared certainly the fighting and the death to Wiley e. Coyote. And he said, oh, that's the sort of thing I want to come up with. Actually, it's going to be a bit ridiculous and over the top so that it's more cartoony. Yeah. It's so interesting because there were moments that were like that. There there were mm. death scenes that I absolutely laughed at. Um, and I think 
I have some of those in my in my favorite moments, but like when <laughs> He's trying to run across the beach and he's not paying attention to anybody or anything because he's just trying to get to Rita. And like this truck plows by and just like kills him. (laughs) Yeah. Bam. You know, it's so ridiculous. And when the first time he tries to roll under the truck when they're doing the push ups. Yeah. And he just gets flattened. (laughs) Like you don't expect those moments. They're not entirely out of place. No. I mean, it does feel like a serious kind of sci-fi drama action mm-hmm. movie, but they're still not out of place, and it just fits. Yeah, very much so. And I, and I think though that sort of comedic stuff they do is actually doing a lot of work for the film because it's getting us used to the idea of he keeps trying things again and again and again, so that by the time we get the whole going to Whitehall, trying to get across France stuff... Um, we're sort of accepting that this is not necessarily the first time he's doing it. Mm-hmm. That uh, I'm, I'm thinking particularly the bit where they walk down the corridor and they do that kind of dance going mm-hmm. around everyone. It's just getting us used to him learning and remembering each time. Right. But we don't have to see him figuring it out each time because we've done it in a more fun way earlier on. Right. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, it was definitely done almost better than Groundhog Day did it, I think. Hmm. I I think so. There's there's fewer problematic bits to it, certainly. Um, but I think on top of that, it's the like I say, it's the, the sense that the world is more open to him, mm-hmm. that he can go and do different things, and and especially because it reveals different stuff about the day as it goes. The fact that it's fairly late on that we see him getting into a fight with the guys that he caused to have the push ups. Now they hadn't introduced any of that, and at that point, they're already showing that he's been through this enough that he's able to dodge the fight without even thinking about it right this is just something that's happened every day we just haven't needed to see it up until now Mm -hmm. well and it's the same thing they at first they were showing us the beginning of the day over and over again and then they stopped doing that Mm. because we didn't need to see it anymore we had already seen how he had progressed from trying to get away from them to just accepting this is what needs to happen and getting to where he needs to get Mm. and i really appreciated the way they did it because it it wasn't boring. It wasn't overly repetitious. Mm-hmm. The way a time loop can be, it just, it worked for me. I, I don't know that there's anything in this movie that didn't work for me, honestly. Okay. I'm going to skip us to the conversation about the ending then. Okay. Um, I, I have to say this is probably a 9 out of 10 film for me. It is really good. It does everything really good. It's got solid science fiction, solid action. The performance is good. I'm going to talk about the aliens in a bit because I like the aliens. I like the ideas behind it. I think the third act is not as good as the first two acts. Basically everything from when he wakes up and he no longer has the power. Um, And then especially the ending, the two-day reset, effectively. Okay. I, I don't think they earn that everyone's alive and happy. Um, I don't think they quite explain it well enough. I think I can headcanon it to get there. Um, but I feel like that whole end piece with them assaulting it, it's incredibly dark. <laughs> it's the first thing. When I was watching it, it was daytime and the curtains were open and everything. I was like, I can't actually see what's going on. It's right. so dark. Um, which again is a contrast to how the, the quality of the production early on. And then it's just... Oh, and now it's reset, and everyone's happy, and it's all great, and they've won. And everyone's alive. Everyone that we've invested in and we were sad about losing as they went. Okay, good. Well done, Phil. Uh, (laughs) What did you think? (laughs) The first time I saw it, I was surprised, and I didn't understand really what had happened. Mm. And I just accepted it as, okay, they're going to live happily ever after. That's how the movie's supposed to end. Great, whatever. And I didn't really put too much thought into it. But then I rewatched it last night and mm. I had some thoughts. And this may go along with head canoning it because I'm not sure that it was explicit in the film. But so you have a question for me later in the outline that we're going to talk about now. Okay. <laughs> because I think it goes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so you wanted to know if I thought that when he jumps into the loop the first time that he dies and then he resets if that's when the time loop started or were the mimics already in a time loop. And that's Mm. why they know that they're coming to the beach that day. Mm. 
And when I saw that question, it kind of blew my mind a little bit. I was like, it didn't even, that didn't occur to me. Like, time loop, because in my understanding of it from just a cursory first watch was the time loop started with him. But then you, I watched it again and you start picking up on these other details. And I realized that the Omega starts the day over again every time an alpha dies, regardless of whether or not there was another person there who was affected by it. And so, because their goal is to not have the alpha die, obviously. And mm. so I think that that's how they knew that they were coming. That's why every single day when it started, the mimics were already there because they've already lived it. And so when they finally defeat the Omega at the end, I think they reset to the point where the Omega's time loop started. Okay. And that's why I think it resets those two days because it's resetting to before the beach. Mm. And that's my head cannon for it too. Basically the same sort of idea. Um, I'm not a hundred percent that it works because it does imply this extra level beyond for the, cause they'd won every battle up to that point. Mm-hmm. So it implies a further back, um, ability to rewind the time and it just seems so convenient that it's the point he first wakes up on the right. helicopter. Right. <laughs> you know, it is a little convenient, but it, it works for me, I think. Partly because the character development of of Tom Cruise's character Hmm. was pretty spectacular in this movie. And when he first wakes up at the beginning of the movie in the helicopter, he is a deeply unlikable character. He is somebody that you kind of want to get thrown under the bus and you don't really care what they do to him because he's just Hmm. awful. And then you go through his transformation throughout this movie And you see him wake up again at the end in that same spot, but he is a fundamentally changed person and you just want him to succeed at that point. Hmm. And so I like that he gets the opportunity to do better in life, I guess. Yeah, very much. It's got that Groundhog Day vibe. Yeah, I like Mm -hmm. that he gets to keep it. You know, it's not like mm-hmm. the day resets and none of it ever happened. He still gets to be the changed person that he is. Mm. And I think that's my favorite part about it. Because we're not even talking about favorite stuff, but I keep talking about how great it is. I love this movie. I really do. Mm. Like, I kind of want to go watch it again right now. <laughs> it It is very watchable. It is really watchable. Mm. And it bothers me a little bit that it's Tom Cruise. <laughs> it's so <Okay>. watchable to <laughs> me. I mean, I don't think he's a horrible person or anything. I just think he's weird. Um, and so this is one of those instances where I can absolutely separate art from the artist. Um, okay. Just because I don't like him as a person. I'm not a fan of Scientology and, and all of that stuff. Mm. But I think he is a phenomenal actor. Even just watching... If, I feel like if we took a screenshot of his first appearance in the movie and compared it to a screenshot of his final appearance in the movie, like his face is actually different. Mm. The way he carries himself and his expression, like he just looks older and more respectful and more, I don't know, like he's seen some shit, Mm. you know, like, and he has learned from it. Yeah, And it takes a special kind of actor to be able to do that. And Tom Cruise has it. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't have the biggest range, like we might see in, in some other actors. Mm-hmm. But the characters he does play, the Tom Cruise characters, he does them very, very well. He is very good at that. Yeah, it's really funny, too, because the day before yesterday... Um, for some reason, I don't even remember what the reason was, but Joseph showed me a clip of a fight scene from Jack Reacher. Okay. And <laughs> then we were watching this again last night, and the fight scene where the the other guys from Jay Squad were trying to basically attack him for making them have to do all the push-ups, mm. and he puts his arm behind his back, and he keeps trying to talk him down. It's like, you don't want to do this, and then he closes his eyes and does all the stepping around. Like, those two scenes were nearly identical. Like, okay. in tone and feel and style. And I was like, oh, okay. So he really does have a limited range in the, the kind of character that he plays. And he mm. he takes the same things from one movie to the other. But I think 
he knows what his range is. And so he picks movies where that range is exactly what's needed for that character. Yeah. I and, and you know, that. that's a special mm. skill, you know, mm. knowing your limits and playing to those strengths. And yeah, I think absolutely. he does that very, very well, which is why I still refuse to watch The Mummy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Joseph put Tropic Thunder on the other day and we got halfway through it. And I was like, I need you to turn this movie off. Because mm-hmm. I I would like to continue my streak of loving every movie that Tom Cruise is in. <laughs> and I'm not sure I'm going to be in that place when this movie is over. <laughs> I have never finished Tropic Thunder. I've already tried once. But okay. yeah, it, it was awful. I turned it off. I got halfway through it. And I was like, I, just, I can't. I can't do it. And I I would like to maintain my belief that Tom Cruise is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, so what I'm hearing is we're not doing Tropic Thunder on the show. No, no. <laughs> okay, good. Um, okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about the book and and the writing of this. Um, okay. Because going from the ending, there was an interesting note that when they started production, they didn't have an ending. And the ending that actually Christopher McQuarrie was coming up with was they go to attack the Louvre he explains the rules to everyone. I think we get the scene where he says, you know, if there's an alpha, you take one for the team. Don't kill an alpha. Um, and they it, they actually had a bit written where one of them did end up killing an alpha. And so the day reset, and as he's giving that speech, they get shot out of the sky, and that's the end of the film. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Which is a lot darker than what we got. Yes. Um, and... and a little bit more akin to the feel of the book and the manga that it's because it, it was then adapted into a graphic manga book um, and then released in the West again with the same name, then re-released at called Edge of Tomorrow to tie in with the film. And there are a lot of differences to it. Obviously it's Japanese it's set in Japan. It's about a Japanese man. Rita is still the same um, is given to be slightly younger but is by and large the same sort of thing. But at, at this point in the in the book, the war's been going on for 20 years, and there has been a bit more win and loss on both sides. The jackets that they wear, the the, the exoskeletons, are, seem to be much more like actual proper big exoskeletons, rather than just a kind of quasi-armour okay. powered thing um, that we see, which I think is better on screen to have it so you can have their heads out and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but it seems to be very much a, a fully fitted thing. But it's it's Rita herself is still in the loop in the book. And they actually want out of the loop. And they realize that, yeah, the, I can't remember what they call them, but you still have this idea of the alpha and the, what do they call the court, the, the normal mimics? Betas? Do they call them anything? I don't think they call them anything. No. Um, and there's this whole idea that actually they're antennae for the sort of alpha idea. So you have to kill all of the antennae before killing the alpha. Mm. So they start, he starts looping again and again and again to work out how to do this. Um, but even on, on the second loop, and it, it's weird. I don't think I've ever read a time loop like this in a book, um, with such a sort of tight time loop. You know, it, the ones I have read have been over years and years and years. Um, mm. And the second time, on the second loop, he thinks it was a dream. And it's really weird how similar everything is. And then because there are a few changes in what he does, the the start of the battle where the book opens and his friend next to him is shot in basically the first page, as soon as he gets to the battle, the shot doesn't come for his friend, it comes for him. <laughs> and then he loops again. Okay. And it it takes about four loops for him to finally buy into it and start going, okay, I'm going to learn how to do this. And he starts training and meets Rita earlier and all this kind of thing. And they then work it out and start trying to take out the uh, aliens uh, or the antennae. And when they finally manage to do it and take them all out, because I think the mimics themselves do move differently on each loop. So they just have to get good at combat. It's not about learning the moves. Mm-hmm. Um it still loops anyway, and then you get kind of book two, part two, and it's it fully changes and gives you a lot more of her backstory. And then when they try and take out the antennae again, she attacks him. And it turns out that, that she thinks they have become antennae as well. So she needs to kill him and then kill all the antennae and then 
<laughs> they can uh, they can get out of the time loop. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, and it gets much darker. He ends up killing her, and he ends up going and serving with the American military. It's not the end of the war, which is oh, wow. possibly a better place to leave it if you're yeah. leaving it open for more story. Um, yeah, it's it's much darker and much more in tone with what they were writing originally. Mm-hmm. I think I like the movie better. I think it works to be a bit more satisfying. I just think it's too much. Right. Especially to go back so far. Like, wait, what? <laughs> well, that I mean, that was my initial reaction was, mm. what? Yeah. How did it, how did this happen? Mm. Like, I expected it to reset back to when his time loop started. Yeah. I, I thought when they went there, and particularly when the alpha started coming for him right at the end, I thought it was going to be a thing of, Okay, if I kill this alpha, at least I can, like, try and get in its blood and start again or something. Right. Something like that. Mm-hmm. Mm. The The other bit that feels a little forced, more than a little forced, that feels fairly forced, is the romance. I'm I'm not sure they do Emily Blunt as not part of the time loop very well. The amount of times we see her getting exasperated and, oh, you know, I'm hurting, I just want to reset... It, it sort of implies she remembers them when clearly she doesn't. Um, and and to imply that they get closer and closer as it goes on. Uh, and it's almost a bit more like that Groundhog Day thing of him working out how to woo his Rita. Mm-hmm. Uh, Andy McDowell? Yeah. Mm. I think... I think I didn't look at it from that perspective because oh. I was looking at it from the perspective of he is clearly, I mean, he is spending more and more time with her because he's living this day every day and he's getting further in the day with her every day. And so he is actually spending more time with her. And so from Mm. his perspective, I absolutely see his feelings growing for her Mm. and understand why he feels that way. I didn't feel like that they made it ambiguous with her. I felt like, she was playing the character fairly well as someone who is going through it and, and only getting to do it once and only remembering one time, partly because each time he would have gone back to her, he would have been able to get her up to speed, which is why they were able to start further. Like he didn't, eventually they didn't have to do the training stuff anymore because she's already done that. He's already been trained. So Mm. when she meets him for the first time, they're already starting somewhere else. And because she's been through the loop, she trusts him on those things because she's experienced it herself. Mm. And they're the only two people who understand kind of what's happening here. And so that in itself is enough to bring them together, I think, which is Mm -hmm. why the ending itself doesn't bother me. I, I choose to believe that they live happily ever after, even though from her perspective, they haven't gone through any of it because... It happens tomorrow, you know? Yeah, that's, but he's that's gonna, gonna be, be a able, tough sell. It is gonna be a tough sell, but he's gonna be able to walk her through all of it and she's gonna believe him. And so they're gonna get to spend time together while he's telling her these things and they're mm. gonna get to know each other in a new and different way. So that's why I think it didn't the romance didn't bother me. Um, because especially the way they left it with him still going to her. And the movie changing her initial reaction to him because now she's reacting to an officer instead of mm. this other random guy who's coming up to her. Um, I-, I liked it's very open ended, and I like it. Mm. It lets me hold on to this idea that these things can work without them being explicit about it. But I'm also a sucker for romance, and you know that. Yeah, and if they are making it more lighthearted, yes, making it more... Uh, the, the idea of love and she's for, always going to fall for him, yes, yeah, that's okay. Do, do you know what you've made me think of in, in everything you were saying there is... Uh, thinking again about the sequel, if he's infected with Omega blood, as it were... And that's mm-hmm. why he has looped again. What happens if they fall in love, get married, have kids, grow old, and he dies? 
in his 80s and then loops back to this day. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but surely that wouldn't work. Surely the alphas themselves at some point would die of natural causes. Right. <laughs> huh. Yeah. Let's, okay, like time travel, looping, time. Yeah. It's just, let's not try to pull on those threads too it, much. Is it that by that point, his own blood would have regenerated so many times over? Uh, he, he would no longer have the Omega blood in him? Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> we'll leave and that for another day. <laughs> yeah. that's the, the science of the book is a little bit better. It's about the uh, tachyon particles that the um, mimics give off. That dying so close to one of them as it's doing this thing has allowed them to take the ability. It's okay. not just alien blood. <laughs> <laughs> I like the simpleness of it, honestly. Yeah, it's it's it, you know Star Trek sort of stuff. It's not yeah. the deepest science. Yeah, right. <laughs> and and speaking of the blood, I do like the one rule that is very clever that there is a way to lose this ability. Mm-hmm. Um. And I, I quite like that they don't tell us how long she had the looping ability for. Not necessarily how many loops, but did she help them win at Verdun and then go on for ages again? And then something happened? Did she, you know, at, at points have weeks and weeks of living and then dying and then going back to the beginning of the Verdun battle? Oh, wow. Hmm. I didn't even think about that. I, I really like that rule. It's really nice that there is a way of taking it away and that they just kind of feel it. They know that they're mm-hmm. not able to do it anymore. Which, mm, okay. <laughs> it's a little woo-woo, but I mean, we'll, it's we'll a sci-fi fantasy, one, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have a question. Mm, go on. Actually, I have a couple questions. Mm. So by the time we figure out that she is aware of the loops... And and the way it was introduced when she recognizes what's happened and she says, come find me when you wake up. Initially, my thought was, oh, my God, she's in the loop, too. That's not yeah. where the movie went. Apparently, that's where yeah. the book, book was, but that's not where the movie mm. went. But in in that scene, he has obviously gone through this dance a few times because he knew exactly where the mimics were going to be to kill them. Yeah. So wouldn't she have figured it out sooner? Like, yeah. she, wouldn't she have been able to say, like, as soon as he started telling her, um, you know, you need to move out of this over here, and then he shot the thing, you know, wouldn't she have been able to see that he was in the loop, and so he would have started training with her sooner than he did? Well, but they do show us that it takes her that long. It takes her that long to tell him, and we can assume it takes her that long to tell him every single time. Okay. That's the first time he's made it through that stretch where right. he's killed every mimic. He's killed them fast enough that the ship hasn't exploded, <laughs> that nothing else has happened. That's the okay. first time he's made it that far. And sh- that's the point at which she's prepared to say, okay, I get it. Okay. So it's just he just never quite made it far enough for her to get it out. Yeah. Okay. I can accept that then. mm and he has got a really good memory <laughs> of where everything happens every time. It's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. I was it's... just curious, like, how many times do you think he went through this? I know we, we talked about this with Groundhog Day, too. Mm. And it just feels like it's probably in the thousands. Yeah. But particularly to try to learn the battle in so many different ways. That the that initial training, then the training with her, then the trying to get through the battle with her, then the Whitehall stuff and doing the dance down the corridor and mm-hmm. all of that. Like, there are, is a lot of different things going on that you assume each time took him 40, 50, 100 different attempts. Right. Mm. Yep. In, in the book, he actually ends up writing the number of the loop on his hand. He gets like 160 at one point. Um, mm-hmm. I think they even get into the 200s. But every time he wakes up, he just writes a number on his hand. And that's, that's oh, how he knows okay. how many times he's looped. Right. I, I don't think it's necessary. But in film, it works that you can then take the short hand that he's just done it X number of times and figured it out. Right. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. So how how does time looping like this work 
on your like mental and physical health. That's what I was thinking about in this. Because at least in Groundhog Day, Bill Murray's character got to go to sleep at the end of every day and then he just woke up the next day. So his <laughs> okay. body was still resting and like Cage just died and then like woke up immediately restarting the loop. And so it feels mm. like to me his brain never got to shut off. And that just feels weird. Uh, hmm. Two two thoughts. I'm not sure how good these are. I mean, there, there is a night in between him waking up and the beach, I think. Okay. I, d- I don't think they... I think they are shipping off the next day. Oh, well, maybe you're right. Because when he does end up back at the general... At the general's office, I think the general says yesterday. Like, he mm. wasn't there twice. He wasn't at Whitehall twice in the same day. Yeah. Okay. But but also, when he wakes up, he wakes up. Well, when when it loops, he loops into waking up. Yeah. So he loops into a body that is fresh. If fresh is the right word. Right, right. Mm. <laughs> okay. I guess I just... I worry about his mental state, I guess, is mm. what it is. <laughs> they they do show that quite nicely. That, like, he goes quite dark at one point and is just killing everything on the beach and never making it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do quite like that, that he just... Uh, the whole bit of him just demanding um, the ammo on the ship before it explodes. Where's your helmet? No, no, we want it's a distraction. Have you been drinking? I need three more clips of five, five, six, eight grenades, and an extra battery. Get it. And then being like, hey, mate, there's a problem with your suit. Yeah, there's a dead guy in it. Hey! Hey, mate! I think there's something wrong with your suit. There's a dead guy in it. Yeah. And everyone's like, whoa, <laughs> keep away from this dude. Right? <laughs> I like that. I also think it's really interesting that they took the time to show us that there were loops where he just was tired of doing it and he skipped the beach altogether. Yeah. Like he was just like, I'm not going to do this today. Mm. Um, like dealing it, – and it's such – God, it's such a small piece of the movie. But mm-hmm. if you stop to think about it critically, it has a lot to say kind of about – philosophy like Mm -hmm. god it's really nihilistic it's like i can't do anything about it anyway you know and then they still come and get him and he still dies and yeah the day resets and it's not like he does it to go have fun Mm. you know it's not like well you know it's my last day on earth i'm gonna die and i can do it over and over again so now i'm gonna go learn how to play the piano and i'm gonna go do all this (laughs) other stuff he just goes and has a beer but you can tell he's had to do that a couple of times because he's had to figure out how to get the motorcycle and get off the base Mm. which he wouldn't have been able to do that in one try, Yeah, you know? So he actually spent time figuring out how he was going to avoid the battle. Mm. And this was like stuck in the middle and it's so small, but I think it has a lot. It it says a lot about the character, Mm -hmm. especially to have done it in the middle because like, he's not doing it out of cowardice at that point, you know, in the beginning it would have been, but by sticking it in the middle, it's, He's defeated Mm. and he has to figure out how to get re-motivated again. And I think he does. They don't really show us how that happens, but I think it might be that he just figures out that no matter where he ends up, they're still going to find him because they're looking for him too, because they have to kill him to stop the loop. Right? Yeah. I really like the, the the thing that you're saying there about how it does so much for the character. Because mm-hmm. I really like that scene for, for kind of the same reasons, but I like what it does for the film. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, like, it's really important to give you a chance to catch your breath because the film's been pretty pale male up until that point. Well, yeah. And he, ju- he just decides he's done with it. And, and he uh, that's on the back of all the stuff with him training with her and her resetting him. Um but it's really good to show that actually if he walks away from this, he doesn't get away from this. They wipe out everyone who goes and tax and then they destroy London. Right. And, uh, by inference, the world. 
and you just see that swarm of mimics coming down the Thames and taking him, and it's just, you cannot walk away from this. You are the only person who can actually do something to stop this. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's really important to sort of give him that motivation, as as well as showing he's in the depths of despair and just wants to get away from it all, and it's taking time to figure it out. It's great. It's like, like you say, it's a little scene. It does so much good work. It does. It's there's some great writing for a quote unquote sci fi film. Mm. You know, you expect these kind of movies to just be fighty fighty kick kick, but this one's not. It it has yeah. layers. It has depth. It's just really good. Mm. Okay, so do you have stuff that was particularly good? Stuff that uh, in watching it a couple of times now, you're like, the, okay, that's one of the great bits of it. Well, we've talked about some of them because I've been gushing about this movie the whole time (laughs) um we talked about just the his character development he's deeply unlikable and then he becomes into this really great Mm. man um the poorly timed deaths they make me laugh um god his his delivery the first time that rita takes him to her friend Mm -hmm. and he's showing off the like the holograms of the the alphas and the omega and tom cruise's delivery on First of all, this was a great presentation. This is a terrific presentation. Terrific. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that just, it made me giggle. Um, so good. And then I think just just the movie itself, you know, you've got this this relationship that's being developed on screen. You know, she's only known him for a day, but he is watching her die over and over and over again. And I can't imagine the weight that has on a person. and. He, you can see that weight visibly on him as the movie progresses. Like, mm. I don't know how he did it. I really don't. I don't think I could do it. But you can just see it. Like, his shoulders, he carries himself differently by the end of the movie just because he has had to go through this. And then, you know, you get the one time where he decides not even to go to her. Like, he skips going to her and he tries to do it himself. Because he cannot watch her die one more time. Yeah. You know, and even I think my thought at that point was he can't save her life, but at least he doesn't have to watch her die again. Mm -hmm. And to get that kind of depth from a movie like this is unexpected. And I really enjoyed it. Yeah, they do their relationship so well. Mm -hmm. The the bonding between them. And and, uh, Emily Blunt herself is very good in this. I, I think probably better than anything else I've seen her in. Despite being... You know, she doesn't talk much, but everything she does is intentional and, and shows her decision behind it. Mm-hmm. I, I, I love her. Uh, it, it's used very well within the montage, but her ambivalence to resetting him and just, no, nope, this isn't worth it. Let's start over. I think we better start over, don't you? What? Hold on. Listen. Okay, do it. I think I'm okay. On your feet, maggot. 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 I'm trying to be nice to you, maggot. Now move. You okay, Kate? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Your leg's broken. No, I, I can still feel my toe. Come on. Yeah. And, and <laughs> she just prepared to pull out a gun. She has become so closed off to the pain and the shock of it. She's just prepared to do it. Yeah. And, and she she jokes about it later on. We should just reset. Whoa! It's a dead end. Hey, just... If it's all the same to you, I'm tired, I'm in pain, I'd rather just stop fresh. I'll tell you what, take a few minutes. Coffee's ready. I'll look around for the keys. That's productive. Ten minutes. Okay. And then I'm killing you. (laughs) Yeah. I think Emily Blunt and Tom Cruise was an unexpected pairing, Mm. but it worked well. Yeah. They they played well off of each other in this movie. Mm. I, I think I would have preferred it had they not kissed. I, I could live without the bit of him being like, have you tried sex? Um, <laughs> but, you know, Hollywood. I have read that apparently it was unscripted that she kissed him. I don't believe that, personally. Um, you know, they love a romance, but it would actually work better if it was just that they were good comrades. And yes, you could see something coming of it and that they need each other, but it doesn't have to be forced in that way. Yeah. Okay. Tweet is um, I'm I'm surprised you're not mentioning Bill Paxton. 
Well, you had him in your list, so I didn't want to take it. Well, no, I put him on there because you didn't put him on there. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was genuinely surprised. I had left him off my list. Oh, okay. you'd put him on yours because Bill Paxton's in this. Bill Paxton is in this. And when I saw him, I went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> he is exceptional in this. He is absolutely exceptional. It's great. Good news is there's hope for you, Private. Hope in the form of glorious combat. Battle is the great redeemer, the fiery crucible in which the only true heroes are forged. The one place where all men truly share the same rank, regardless of what kind of parasitic scum they were going in. But Bill Paxton's great in everything he did. Yeah. So. Um, the, the moment that stands out for me is the thing of him telling one of the other soldiers he has to look after, Tom Cruise. Griff! Sarge? Take care of Private Cage. What, all day? Something tells me it won't be nearly that long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it won't take long. Yeah, it's so good. Any more? I mean, I've spent the last 50 minutes or so gushing about this movie, <laughs> so I think you should get to gush now. Um, we, We've mentioned the monta- montages several times. They're, they're really good at... Uh, like I say, the early stuff teaching us that he is going to keep trying stuff over and over again until he gets good, so we can just accept that he's good and that he's done mm-hmm. it several times. But the montages build on themselves really well. You get that very first montage of him on the beach again and again and again, you know, trying to save this dude. A ship falls on him. He saves him, and then he does something else, and then a mimic gets him. He tries and, and they just keep doing, again, those wacky deaths and trying to get a good day at the beach until he finally saves her and realizes there's more to the story. Mm hmm. Um, you then get the training sequence with her, which is probably the funniest because of her. And like I say, her <laughs> willingness to just shoot him in the face and him trying to be like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, and then finally to their assault where they're trying to get on to get through the beach so they can get to the dam. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's the final act, proper montage. Um, because it's done really seriously, but it's the point of, okay, they're powered up, they can both use their suits really well, he's doing a lot more melee stuff, which you see her with a sword all the time. And again, that's the thing from the book, that she uses an axe in the book, because guns can jam and you can run out of ammo, but if you've got an axe, you can just keep going. Right. Um, I, I, I really like that whole bit where you see them both being really good and just working it out and figuring it out. That's probably the most video gamey bit. Um, I do love that it then goes full video game and does, and now we're going to strip them of their powers and everything's going to have to be done once perfectly in, in a whole long run, which is, you know, the way that most good video games do a, you know, late stage switch. Mm-hmm. We've stripped you of all your teammates and all your powers. See what you do now. Right. Yeah. I love the montages. The montages make it, I think. Yeah. They were done really, really well um, to show how repetitive life has been for him without being repetitive for us Mm. and actually hearing you talk about it reminded me of one of the moments i really liked it was when the the j squad is like in the the pit of some sort and he Mm -hmm. comes in to save them and he just starts running around the edge of it in a spiral like shooting all the mimics to save them (laughs) like that's a great moment everybody's like what the heck? How did he do that? You know? Yeah. That's really... It's a great effect anyway. Mm-hmm. It shows us his progression really well. Excellent. Mm-hmm. It's good. And I, I, I like the personalities of J-Squad. Yeah, they've got a, a, a proper, you know, Marine Corps type feel to them. Mm-hmm. Um, But they're all slightly different, but they are clearly a squad. They work together and they've got pre-existing relationships. It comes through very well. The only thing that bothered me... Mm. was Nance's accent. It was Which so was terrible. Nance? The girl. Okay. Nance, why do I dislike it? Because it entertains the notion that our fate is in hands other than our own. It was so terrible. And then I looked it up and I found out she's British and that's why she was having such a hard time trying to do a Southern okay. American accent. <laughs> it did not work. <laughs> I didn't notice, I'm afraid. I think I'm distracted by... Jackson from Living oh, yeah. Tomorrow being in there, and <laughs> yeah. um, the Aussie dude who played Griff. 
who it took me a very long time to place. He's in Speed Racer. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was watching going, I know this dude and I do not know from what. See, that's how I felt about the general. And then finally I looked it up last night and I was like, oh my God, how did I not put that together? That's Mad Eye Moody. <laughs> it's Brendan Gleeson. It's a proper actor. <laughs> I was like, I recognize his face but I and I mm. recognize his voice, but I can't place it. If he had had long hair, I would have been able to place it. But Okay. Um, the, the long without the long hair and the eye patch, I just couldn't quite figure it out. Mm. I love the aliens, the mimics. Mm-hmm. They, they are legitimately alien aliens, which I've said before. I always like to see. Mm-hmm. You know, they do not work like bipedal people with a bumpy forehead. <laughs> so it's always very interesting to see them. I, I, I like the difference between the alpha and the the normal mimics. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, that's some good design. But the the moment that I love most of all. It just just works so well is on the second or third loop where he's knocked down, Rita sees him, and she comes over and takes his battery pack. I'm hit. I'm hit. How bad is it? Is there, is there a, a, a lot of blood? You have a hole in your chest. Really? Whoa. Take my my battery battery, and then it just goes off. Right, and she doesn't even know anything about the loop at that point. Yeah, exactly. It's just we we get to see a bit of how good she is at combat. Mm-hmm. Uh, even without the loop, she is just really fierce at this point, and she's so uncaring. Like you're just cannon fodder. You can help me by giving up your power. Right. Yeah, it's so dark. <laughs> She's like, you're dead anyway, so this will help mm. me stay alive longer. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's supposed to be a little callback to the book, because the first time, the very first day, before any looping, he's dying, and she's over him, and she stays with him until he dies. So this is like a dark twist on that. Oh, wow, like, yeah. Because I think she does make a comment of, I'll take your ammo when you're dead, something like that. Okay. But, yeah. Huh. But I love that moment. I It tells you... All the stuff that I like about the character, it mm-hmm. tells you all about that in that very first meeting with her. Oh, yeah. She is serious business. Mm. I I mean, you've already mentioned it, but I really like her willingness to just always shoot him in the head. Yeah. Just like, this isn't working. Bam. Yeah. <laughs> it says a lot about her as a person, I think. Mm. <laughs> all right. We've been gushing for a really long time, and I already kind of took your last question to me. So is there anything else that we need to discuss about Edge of Tomorrow? So we often fix a film. We we change scenes or moments that we think absolutely did not work. The trailer for this does not work. The trailer for this sets it up like this really intense sci-fi time loop, gritty and dark, which it's not. Is there anything you think you would have put into the trailer to have made it better or done with the trailer to make it better that wouldn't necessarily give them away all the best bits? I don't remember the trailer because I okay. didn't go watch it for this. Uh, so I only saw it back in 2014 right before the, the movie came out. Mm. I would probably put in part of one of the montages and particularly show at least the death where he's running across the beach and he gets hit by the truck. Right. Like, I would probably include that one. Okay. Um, And then have the day restart, have him wake up again, or, or just show somehow in a montage manner that he's repeating the day. Mm. Um, Just to – because that one's funny. It yeah. just is. Um, And it works on its own. Like, you don't need – any outside explanation like you would need if you tried to do the one where he's rolling under the the truck mm. and that sort of thing. So for a trailer, I think just him getting run over on the beach would work. Other than that, I don't know. Because I don't remember much about the trailer. I feel like the trailer sets up a movie that's very different from this movie, but I don't mm. remember why I think that. Yeah, it's all his bit of, you know, listen... Once, listen to me, you know, I can only 
this is the first time it's happening for you, but it's happened lots for me. Everyone's going to die. We need to stop it. <laughs> Your very lives depend on it. Yeah, exactly. It's got that whole kind of <laughs> thing going on. Okay. Um, yeah, I I think that's... I, cause I was wondering maybe the montage with hit, her training him and resetting him. Mm-hmm. and set that oh up yeah some core. of that too yeah but it, it does give away a bit about what's actually going to happen although, although the, mo- the the trailer does have the bit of her saying when you see me come and when you wake up come and find me okay so it's giving away that but it doesn't show what happens of it necessarily uh, so yeah doing the beach one would be a really nice way to do it and show him trying to get better mm-hmm. although it does yeah. take 35 minutes to get there <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I'm not a movie trailer maker, so I'm okay. not sure how I would do it. Okay. Because the no, movie I... trailer needs to be longer than five seconds, and that's all I got, so. No, but I think I think replacing it with much more of the loop. Yeah. And then have him explaining some of the seriousness of it. Yeah. But just make it a war thing. Don't, don't even necessarily make it aliens. Introduce the aliens later in the trailer. Mm-hmm. Just he's fighting a war, and he dies. And then show him dying in funny ways. <laughs> yes. Mm. Just lots of death. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, if you would like to join the conversation, you can use the hashtag PC Deprived on Twitter. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Eloquent Gushing. Or you can send an email to podcast at eloquentgushing.com. You can find us both on Twitter. I'm at Manny K. And I'm at Matthew Vose. We are completely funded by listeners like you through Patreon. Anything you can give, even $1 a month, gives access to exclusive content and helps to support the network and develop new shows. To find out more, visit patreon.com slash eloquentgushing. And don't forget to check out our homepage, eloquentgushing.com, where you can find all of our other shows and blogs. We'll be back next week with another episode where we'll talk about Grand Canyon. Until next time, I'm Andy Kay. And I don't know, we've never gotten this far. Pop Culturally Deprived is an Eloquent Gushing production. For more information, go to eloquentgushing.com or find us on Twitter at Eloquent Gushing.